this is a great, great topic, and it's going to be on the use of opioids in outpatient breast surgery, and of course the uh, and uh, uh, Francisco is going to uh, introduce our distinguished authors who are from Emory, who obviously are incredible experts. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Laskin. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about its role, its use, its safety, what to do, what not to do. So, Thank you, Dr. Rorick. Well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who's uh, here and who's listening. Uh, we have the privilege of uh, discussing this very important topic with uh, Dr. Laskin and Dr. Hart, who wrote a fantastic article. And... Um, we have the privilege of, the, of having this PRS Journal Club here at, at the ASPS Center stage at Plastic Surgery, the meeting. But before we dive into the discussion, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you uh, who participate in the PRS Journal Club on a monthly basis. Uh, it truly, th through this uh, uh, encouragement, uh, we are very proud to say that we have won over the past two years very important prizes for uh, best online community. And uh, I'm also happy to announce that this year, uh, the PRS Journal Club podcast is finalist for best podcast again. So thank you all for your support. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't already uh, um, uh, do so, I highly recommend following our monthly podcast on iTunes, YouTube, PRSJournalClub.com, and uh, also the PRS Journal Club on uh, Facebook. And why would you want to join us? I mean, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great event. But, uh, you know, we have a list of selected articles to pair the podcasts and journals, which are all free on prsjournal.com. Uh, but now it is a great honor to uh, uh, introduce and present our guest uh, uh, here, Dr. Alexander Hart, who's a PGY-5 uh, uh, at Emory. And then and we have Dr. Albert Loskin, who's the program director and professor at the Division of Plastic Surgery, Emory University of Medicine. So thank you so much for being here with us. We chose uh, to discuss this article because uh, opioid use is truly a epidemic uh, issue in uh, the United States. And uh, the author's uh, aim of the study was to analyze the use of opioids in pain control and patient, patient satisfaction following outpatient breast surgery. And they conducted a uh, prospective study uh, of 60 secondary breast reconstruction patients and uh, 30 uh, breast reduction patients. Uh, they gave uh, 30 tablets of Percocet, and they uh, also gave um, uh, pre- and post-operative uh, questionnaires at different time points. And what did the results show? Well, uh, it, it seemed that the reconstructed patients took 75% uh, at least uh, one opioid uh, tablets for a mean of 8.5 days post-operatively, and by day 30, 7% uh, still were still taking uh, opioids. And a, and a total of 18 tablets were left over. In contrast, breast reductions uh, took, uh, breast, breast reduction patient took 72% of at least uh, uh, one opioid tablet for a mean of 11 days postoperatively. And by day 30, uh, none, still, um, uh, none were still taking the tablets, which is interesting. And uh, uh, there were a total of 13 tablets uh, left over, but both uh, showed that uh, in both groups, uh, and the majority in both groups, uh, used uh, over-the-counter medications like non-anti-inflammatory non uh, non medications, and there was no difference in pain, enjoyment, and activity scores when comparing when those patients that used and didn't use. And then in terms of side effects, um, the breast reconstruction group had a 38% 30 of those patients had side effects versus 53% of the reduction patients. So that's something to bear in mind when we're prescribing uh, analgesics to patients, especially if not necessarily needed. But uh, overall, all patients were satisfied with, uh, with the pain regime. And uh, in fact, the authors concluded that this uh, commonly prescribed pain regime is uh, successful and adequate for pain relief and satisfaction for uh, and, satisf and satisfaction for breast uh, uh, surgery, uh, but it has a substantial number of uh, le leftover tablets. And they also s s state that the prescription of 30 opioid uh, tablets after outpatient breast surgery appears unnecessary and excessive. So before we start the Q&A, I, I just would like to remind you that we will be recording the lecture. Uh, 
uh, and the Q&A to post on the PRS Journal website and the various uh, social media channels. So if you, don't if you still want to ask questions, please come to the mic and just let us know afterwards and we'll make sure that uh, uh, we do not include you in, uh, in, uh, in the video. But I'll start with uh, a question for Dr. Loskin and Dr. Hart and, uh, and then if you guys want to join us, please come, come, come up. After this paper, how has your pres prescribing practice changed uh, your study? So, uh, sorry, how, how, let me rephrase it. How, how, how has your study changed uh, your prescribing practices? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Francesca and everyone for letting us chat about this. Um, there are seats up front for everyone standing in the back. If you guys want to come up front. <laughs> <laughs> We had to let some people, you know, out of the center. There were too many, Dr. Loskin. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say a couple words, and I'm going to have Alexander kind of put, put it all into perspective and kind of talk about what we're doing forward with this data. But, you know, the opioid crisis is the uh, deadliest drug crisis in America. You know, it's a big deal. Uh, overdoses, and it's fueled by opioids, is actually the leading cause of death in uh in American men under the, under the age of 50. Uh, and if you look over the last three years, um, the mortality from synthetic opioids has gone up about 500 540%. <coughs> <coughs> so it's a big deal. And 75% um, of these uh, problems, 75% uh, of heroin overdoses start with prescription drugs. So we, we all have a really a a huge impact on some of this opioid epidemic, which is why we got started with the study in the first place. Um, you know, we're handing out prescriptions. 30 is something we're all used to doing. The question was, is that enough? Is it too much? Because, you know, unfortunately, adults are not the only ones, you know, who are impacted Absolutely. by it. Absolutely. There are a lot yeah. of kids who find their parents' medications. They found unconscious or worse, even dead or, or addicted when they're born. So, you know, there, there's collateral damage. After a mastectomy, um, there is such a thing as, as post-mastectomy pain syndrome. And a lot of patients, it's about 10%, will have chronic pain after mastectomies. And there's a lot of studies, and you know, we'll chat about that, but the ERAS and then the prevention and even non-opioid anesthesia, all that stuff plays a huge impact in who might need opioids afterwards. Um, and we thought these two groups, the reductions and the revisions, are, are a fairly well-controlled group of uh, patients that we can look at, and then that can get applied to you know, everything else we do in, in plastic surgery as well. So that's kind of a little bit of a convoluted answer. It's not even an answer, but I just wanted to kind of give our perspective behind why we started in the first place. And I'm going to let Alexander talk about and and how's the, how's your practice changed since uh, since you've done this study? So um, I'll go over. So the first this study was done basically to look and see what we were doing because I well just from being an intern you just give everyone thirty Percocet for outpatient surgery that's kind of what the upper levels tell you that's what you do so we basically pulled all of our attendings and said what do you give all your patients and we ended up deciding to pull the residents and fellows because they're the ones that write the prescriptions and that's where we came up with thirty Percocet. So after we had done this and we followed the patients in our, this is a relatively small perspective study. We only had 100 patients, but we had 1,500 leftover tablets in this 100 patients. So because of that, and then with all of the data that's come out, really in colorectal and general surgery research on the ERAS protocols, and I think the microsurgery world of plastic surgery has started to catch up, we decided to try some sort of a similar ERAS protocol for plastics. So we have some data, and it's, we're at 100 patients, but we haven't published it yet. And it was presented at our regional meeting about three or four months ago. But basically what we did is we changed the regimen, and it's patients now get 300 milligrams of gabapentin three times a day, ibuprofen and Tylenol scheduled Q6 hours, and then they get five milligrams of, five mili of oxycodone with instructions to take the gabapentin and the Tylenol and ibuprofen scheduled and then just take the oxycodone as needed for severe pain and basically what we found is it results in so, like so they went from 30 to 5 to 5 that's, that's right? amazing so that's amazing so what did, what and did then they find? have we have about most patients still have one tablet left over the pain scores are equitable to what you had in those um yeah. graphs where they start off 
mild, there's a small post-operative spike, and then they end mild. And in our 100 patients, we had a less than 150 tablets left over. So it's a significant, about a 90% decrease in the number of opioids left over and prescribed. That's, that's very significant. And truthfully, I mean, you know, just like you said, as residents, we do just what either our chiefs tell us to do or what our attendings want to do. And especially if you're in private practice, what you want is um, make sure that your patients are comfortable. And this significant change is, you know, it's pretty drastic, literally going from 30 to 5. And uh, I would like just to highlight that you heard this at PRS Journal Club first, okay? So that's, that, that's yet another reason why, why you guys should join uh, uh, every month. Um, no, that's, uh, that, that's great. So, so the, other, the other problem with only giving five is that there are going to be a few people who might need more, and it's hard to predict who's going to need more, but obviously you can't call it in, which is what probably prompted everyone to be giving more in the first place. So, you know, not being able to call it in, suddenly you give more so you don't have to have them come to the office to pick it up. Mm -hmm but that might have been, you know, we're, we're part of the problem that way. Okay. So, you know, if someone needs more and, and it was rare that they needed yeah. more, um, then they come into the office or we usually can give them something less strong or non-opioid for pain management. And out of curiosity, the cohort that you had, you said that you gave 30 Percocets uh, and then there were also some over-the-counter medications. Did you instruct uh, the patients specifically what over-the-counter medications would you tell them well if you don't have that much pain you can alternate uh, ibuprofen with uh, Tylenol or uh, or because I think people a lot of patients don't quite get that you know Percocet has a bit of Tylenol but if right. your pain is not that bad you can just take Tylenol you don't need to right. take the narcotic so in this uh, this study here we didn't we wanted to really just kind of see what we were doing and how we were doing it but then afterwards, when we started doing the more opioid sparing protocol, we did. They all got an instruction sheet that basically said Tylenol, ibuprofen are fine. You can take them together, you can alternate them, um, and structured it that way. And we basically found that if you, kind of what I took out of this is, if you give patients 30 Percocet, they're going to take the Percocet, whether they have mild, moderate, or severe pain. And if you give them other options, then they will tailor it themselves because you're on there and on their instruction sheet. And preoperatively, we said oxycodone, severe pain, maybe save it at, for at night when you're, you know, been moving around all day. And patients still had tablets left over. So I think that is, it's all in how you set it up a little bit. And I think a big part of it is buy-in. And that's why the, the ERAS stresses it, that patients need to know going in that, like, Alexander was saying, if they think they're going to need Percocet, they're going to need Percocet. Yeah. Whereas if they think they can probably get by with, you know, local blocks, ibuprofen, muscle relaxants, then they're probably not going to use the opioids as much. So yeah. definitely uh, instructions and buy-in on the patient's part is a huge part of it. And then the ERAS, there, there's so many, you know, patient pain is definitely like the fifth vital that's important, but there's so much that, that goes into it. Uh, to get them off these opioids and narcotics. So, I mean, it seems like patient education, use of other agents, those are, the, those are two key things that, uh, that we should be promoting. Uh, is there anything else that, as plastic surgeon, we can try to do to uh, um, have an impact and, uh, on this opioid crisis and reduce it? Well, yeah, I think the intraoperative blocks are a big part of that. So, you know, minimizing the number of narcotics um, and then there's, there's monitoring systems now that, uh, you know, we're all been monitored how many narcotics we prescribe. And um, that's important as well. Uh, but I think, you know, patient education, non-opioid type anesthesia, intraoperative blocks, and then using alternative methods for post-operative pain. I agree with Dr. Laskin. Also, like he was, Dr. Laskin was saying, that there are a percentage of patients that do develop some sort of a chronic pain syndrome that there's a lot of research being done. It's probably on the like scale of the fibromyalgia, like psychosomatic somewhat pain. And I think maybe trying, when you meet people preoperatively, to screen for those patients and know who's likely at risk and who may or may not be more anxious about pain is helpful. Um, because there's a lot of research into the anxiety of some post mastectomy patients and that they experience anxiety and then their pain scores are higher, they're more sensitive to pain. 
And in those cases then, just as a follow-up question, and by the way, I encourage people to come and ask questions. I do love my voice and hearing myself, but uh, uh, you know, I like uh, other people as well to chip in if you guys have any questions. But, uh, oh, we do have our... No, 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 I don't want to see your thunder. Can we have this microphone on, please? So I'll just, uh, uh, whilst they're sort out the microphone. So our, our point then, uh, should we consider getting um, perhaps pain specialists beforehand so that they can help us manage these patients without narcotics? And uh, the second question would be, um, uh, post-operatively, at what stage would you recommend uh, uh, um, consulting pain management, whether it's chronic pain or acute pain? Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely need buy-in from anesthesia. And you know, we've, been, we've been chatting with them because they're doing more and more blocks. Um, they're, they're, they're really interested in um, non-opioid anesthesia and non-opioid post-operative pain management. Um, you know, patient reported outcomes is a big deal. And, you know, we're all being judged by what our patients feel like after the surgery. And, and pain is a huge part of that. They're not that satisfied if they're in pain, and, and we're kind of, in a way, failed in what we did if they're hurting. Um, you know, the, the chronic pain stuff, you know, I would definitely get them in. I, I typically don't manage pain after a couple of months, um, and if they're still requiring narcotics in that small percentage of patients, then I send them off to pain clinics. Um, but definitely getting buy-in from anesthesia is huge because you know, they're the blocks that we can do. There's local we can inject, um, but but they have you know the, uh, a lot of blocks that they enjoy doing and uh, cath epidurals and things like that. And that whole pain response, if you can you know minimize it during the surgery, definitely has an impact on how they do afterwards too. Thank you, Dr. Oskin. Great. Congratulations on a great paper, and thanks for some important points brought up today. Um, to somewhat touch on one of the things you had brought up. How or are you and how are you bringing up these things initially in the consultation? If a patient asks for um, what their pain is going to be like in a breast reduction or a, um, a recon consult, are you going along the lines of telling them these are the medications we give you, we expect you might need narcotics for a couple of days and then come off of them? Is it something more general or are you giving them more strict instructions about what to expect postoperatively and do you think that helps? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it helps. I think that we can do a better job. Like, we, we don't. Um, definitely, it, it takes sitting down, especially with the, the deep flaps or the, the immediate reconstructions. Um, you know, having someone sit down and spend an hour talking about what they might expect, you know, the drains, the pain, the abdomen, the breast, um, that is just so important in how they're going to do. Uh, what we do is we, we give them instructions and we kind of talk it over with them because you know they you don't want to just give it to them afterwards and then have them try to figure it all out so if they go in knowing what they might need um i, I think that's much more impactful and it, it it affects how many they use like if you give someone 30 they'll probably use a lot more than they need if you give them five they still might not even use them all but um i think if they don't expect to use 30 then they won't Thank you. Anna, our new PRS Global Open Ambassador. Thanks for a great discussion so far. Uh, one of the things that's come up more recently in the literature is the gap in how to actually manage patients who come in on preoperative um, narcotic medications. Can you speak a little bit to how you manage that type of patient? We excluded them from our study, but I will say just when they do come in and they are already on, like some of the post mastectomy patients in pain, they get the same Tylenol, ibuprofen, particularly for secondary breast surgery because, I mean, if you, that surgery really should not be that painful. And then they still get the five milligrams of oxycodone. I think for the most part, most pain management um, doctors, if you are on a chronic pain regimen, they usually keep that part the same and then they increase it with uh, either five milligrams of, they don't usually mess with their, I guess, long-term delayed release medicine for small surgeries. So since this was just small surgeries, we kept them on the same. We didn't change it, although we excluded them from our data. So, yeah, in the, in the, the chronic 
So the pa patients coming in on chronic opioids or long-term medications, I'm a lot lower threshold for getting pain management involved early on. Number one, number two, five is probably not going to be enough for them. So those are the patients who are going to require more than five, you know, if they're going to eat it like candy. So, you know, I, that's why we excluded them. They're, they're another whole separate group that needs to be studied. Um, you know, in the, in the reduction patients, that was different because, you know, they all have pain early pre-op uh, because that's part of needing to get a reduction. Um, but we found that in the revisional breast patients, some of them required nar narcotics longer than we thought they would because it's not really a, you know, it wasn't like a biggest, of big surgery. But I think that's where this whole, you know, post-mastectomy pain or post-breast surgery pain syndrome, um, you know, that's probably where it rears its head. I'm interested. I mean, Anna is from uh, Canada. I have a question for you, actually. And I don't know if there are any other foreign doctors here, but I, I'm from Italy, trained in England. And when I came to train here in the States, you know, I was kind of astonished of uh, uh, how many opioids we prescribe. Um, for example, for breast reductions, often, uh, you know, we don't even prescribe narcotics. You know, that's, uh, that's how, what, what a big difference. And I was wondering what, what kind of post-operative analgesia for uh, secondary breast reconstruction and breast reduction you have experienced in your, in your program. I would say the culture in Canada is very similar to the States and we do have a lot of over prescription just based on that being our routine practice to prescribe without thinking about actually how much the patients need. So similar in Canada. Well, I think, you know, we went from 30 to 5 and, and the yeah, long-term long goal is to get off all opioids. And so w when we can figure out how to do it without requiring opioids just based on, you know, anti-inflammatories and maybe muscle relaxants and intraoperative blocks, that's really ideal. I think if you could electronically prescribe the opioids, I think it, even for the second study we did, it probably would have been an incentive to at least attempt to not do opioids because most patients took one to three pills. I mean, that's nothing. But because to get those one to three pills, they have to come back to the emergency room or wait till their clinic appointment then we give them to them. But I think if it was something where they could just call, you know, a nurse or a primary, you know, one of the coordinators and say, listen, they said if I called, I could have this and you could prescribe it electronically, I think that would change it because then you wouldn't give them any. Because there are some that were 30 to 50% of them that didn't take the first tablet in both studies, particularly the ERAS study because they didn't need it, but they still had five that they never filled. Jordan Fry, our former Francesco. resident ambassador. <laughs> go, Thanks go, go, Jordan. Uh, panel. Is, is this another um, reason to move to prepectoral? I, I don't know if you guys looked at that or have done some. That could be a way to get these patients off of opioids completely, some of the tissue expander based. Yeah, you're talking about at the immediate yeah. reconstruction? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we haven't looked at it. We've pretty much switched to prepectoral. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say anecdotally that it's significantly improved the post-operative pain. Mm -hmm. um, theoretically, it should, and it might. You know, it's one of the things that we've been talking about, maybe looking into. Uh, but that would be interesting. Great. I mean, I think the muscle, and especially in the radiated patients, is a big part of not just their deformity, but the way they feel. The way they feel. So, thank I you. I would say anecdotally, only because we. See, we have a couple of attendings that still do uh, subpec, and then we have Dr. Lofkin and a couple that do prepec. And I would say the prepec patients almost never want to stay for pain. I mean, it does happen, but I mean, we haven't looked at it, but we could. Um, we have quite a few. Yeah, that's yeah. I don't get the phone calls anymore. <laughs> <laughs> as a, a second question as well, has this changed your management of inpatient breast surgery as well? Like. Um, have you, we're all kind of moving towards an ERAS pathway, but if you could maybe talk about what you're doing for that, for deeps and things like that. It hasn't changed. It has changed the deeps in that we used to, it depends, it's attending dependent, but mm -hmm. on some of the ones that Dr. Glaston does in the mastectomies, we are, start them immediately. They get Tylenol, either 800 Q8 or 600 Q6. They get ibuprofen, and then instead of even starting with Percocet, they all get oxycodone separated from the Tylenol so mm. that they can get the scheduled Tylenol and ibuprofen. Um, and I think we've been using a lot more Toradol, particularly for the deeps, which we weren't before. Yeah, um, I was going to say, we did that too yeah. in Toradol. Yeah, yeah. we did the same in, uh, in yeah. Pittsburgh. I think things like x and mm. muscle blocks, you know, a huge part of that too. Yeah. All right, thank you.
Hi, I'm, Hi, I'm Nick Bott. I'm a plastic surgeon at UNC Chapel Hill. And Dr. Loskin, uh, you were kind of talking about this before, uh, well, you just mentioned it, about um, other adjuncts such as using tap locks or the on cue. Could you kind of, could you both uh, expand on that and, is, and if that's something that you use in your practice? Yeah, so we, we've done some studies on the use of uh, the on cue with tram flaps. This was a few years ago. And the narcotic use was obviously significantly lower in patients who had the uh, on cue, yeah. which makes sense. Um, we haven't specifically studied tap blocks and Expirel, and but those are all things that kind of go into this whole next era of this study where we realized, you know, that's way too many opioids we're given. We need to be doing other things, and one of the other things is blocks and Expirel and things like that. So I think, you know, and, and even the whole movement towards, you know, not general anesthesia and a lot of wide awake surgery, you know, that all kind of minimizes this whole kind of pain crisis. I think that's things that we're all going to be looking at uh, to see if we can prevent some of the chronic pain or some of the patients who get uh, require a lot of narcotics. So, I mean, it's definitely important. And, and a lot of this, uh, you know, the study was actually... You know, the way we came up with it was in chatting with some of our hand colleagues. And, you know, they've done similar studies looking at outpatient hand surgery. And, um, you know, have gone a lot more towards doing blocks and doing local to try to minimize all that. Yeah. A little bit of an unrelated topic. Um, one thing I've had in doing deep laps, one thing I've uh, encountered in a few patients was neuroma formation as being a possible etiology for uh, late pain. Have you uh, in your practice ever seen that? Uh, because in the past couple months, actually, uh, uh, during the revisions, I'll go and have, ex have excised neuromas. Where, where about? The ab at the donor the site, typically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've had a few down here. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if it's from, you know, either catching it in a stitch or yeah. if it's a neuroma. I have had a few of those that you, you know, you, you try to chase and excise the scar tissue. Yeah. Um, Invariably, it goes away yeah. with time, but sometimes it does bother them, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thanks. Um, how are you guiding uh, your office and the call evidence for patients who the answering service on day two and say, I'm out of my five? Like, how do you counsel them? How much more do you get? So for the office, they all, we, when we were doing the study, they all get an information sheet and it talks about their, so the nurses that are discharging them go through the, again, after we've already gone through it, go through what medicines they're going to get. Um, is it not on? Oh. Um, then postoperatively, when we started this, I had told all the residents, if you guys start getting more phone calls, let me know and we'll figure out what to do. But that was never the case. So I can't give you a specific number, but since we started doing this, there haven't been more phone calls. There's probably been the same number. Um, and usually when you tell somebody in the middle of the night that they have to come to the emergency room to get more opioids, they say no, and then they call Dr. Laskin's office, so he probably could speak more to what has happened in his office, but. Yeah, I mean, we, we have the occasional patient who needs more, and I just sign a prescription and we either send it to them or they come in and pick it up, or we try to figure out some non-opioid way of doing it. You know, you chat with them, you talk about the pain, you ask them what they've been doing, and see if you can come up with a way to not have to rely on the opioids. Most of the time, you know, extra strength Tylenol, maybe some stronger non-steroidals um, usually do the trick. We've got him. Hello. Hi, I'm Aaron from The Journal, and um, I have a question from Ira Savetsky via the internet. But Thanks, before Ira. I, but we, before we, we do that, aura. I'd like to just remind everybody we are raffling off an Amazon Echo, so if you haven't gotten a raffle ticket yet, one of my colleagues will be passing those out. So this question is from Ira Savetsky. He says, the discussion regarding preoperative risk factors was particularly interesting. How can we best use this data to identify at-risk patients? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question, and I wish I knew the answer. Um, there, uh, there, there are certain factors that might be more predictive of who would require longer term or more narcotics after the fact. Do you, do you remember anxiety, what the depression, and history of smoking is you is in in patients, not necessarily recon patients. Um, 
in some of these large studies, what they found is that patients, patient factors, not surgical factors like anxiety, anxiety, depression, and smoking were associated with needing more pain medicine and having longer pain, um, longer and higher pain scores postoperatively, as well as needing more prescriptions. So in their study, they used the SF36 and looked at the anxiety and depression score, and that's how they determined it, but that is still a study. So I don't know that there's a perfect way in clinical use outside of giving every patient that form and coming up with an anxiety score to determine exactly which patients might need more, but it was, I mean, I think it's probably similar to any preoperative discussion. When you meet some patients, you can kind of, something goes off in your head that this patient's probably a little bit more anxious than a typical patient, um, and they might need a little more counseling. But I don't know that that means you necessarily just give those patients more narcotics. I think you just have to be willing to maybe spend a couple more minutes and then see what happens. Um. But in, in our data, was, was there anything in the patients who required more that stands out as no, it wasn't related to their secondary surgery it, or the number of procedures they had. The only thing was that they were all secondary breast patients. None of the breast reduction patients ever needed more. Great. Well, it was a great discussion. Great. Thank you so much for your answers. I think we have learned all a great deal on how to tackle these kind of patients. I would like to thank you all very much for being here. I hope you enjoyed our journal club. And uh, I would like to remind you to follow our podcast on uh, prsjournal.com, Facebook, iTunes, and uh, make sure to tune in for next month's uh, uh, PRS Journal Club on uh, Facebook. Dr. Loskin and uh, Dr. Hart, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.